Matthew chapter 19, if you have your Bibles and you want to open that up. And um, I believe the Lord has an assignment for us today. Um, an assignment in the, in the spiritual realm that we need to find our place and we need to stay in our place. Um, have you ever heard someone say, stay in your lane, stay in your lane, you, you know, and, and what that means, what does it mean to stay in your lane? It means this is, you need to stay where you're supposed to be going, and if you get out of your lane, you cause some problems. I want to encourage us as believers in this day and hour that, um, that we, we take our place the way we're supposed to. And I want you to know that Jesus wants the next generation. I said Jesus wants the next generation. Uh, it, the, the culture wants the next generation. Uh, the, the adversary wants the ge- next generation. But I want you to know that Jesus wants the next generation. And if we're not careful, especially, you know, as I had mentioned, uh, um, and it went on, uh, Marilyn had kind enough to put the pictures on Facebook of my little accident that I, that I had and had a little bump on the head and 15 staples in the back of my head and you know, Nathan thinks it's funny, but he gets better reception with his cell phone when he comes back on my head, and he wanted me to come down to his house and, and be their TV antenna, uh, but, um, but anyway, um, is, when I was down there, uh, they said, you know, you probably should go get a, a CT scan because of your age, and it was, you know, really a, a nice when you're hurting physically that they also then kind of get you, you know, on that one too, but as we get older, if we're not careful, the younger generation can annoy us. Why do they do that? Why do they do that? Why won't they pull up their pants? Why, won't, why, don't, they, why don't they cut that thing off the top of their head? Why do, why, why do, they, why do, they, why do they get all those? What do they do? Why, why do they do that? Why, why do they do it? And if we're not careful, we get annoyed. And I look back at, um, I remember when I got my first afro. And my, and my dad, my dad came home and said, Dennis, why'd you do that? <laughs> why'd you do that? Uh, you know, each generation does some things um, that if we're not careful on the outside can annoy us. And we forget Jesus wants the next generation. And so we as believers need to see past those differences, even some of those things that that maybe we we don't understand, or maybe some of those things that even irritate us if we're not careful. And if we're not careful, we allow them to be a hindrance for them coming to know Jesus. Now, in my day and age, it was, was, uh, most of you, some of you would know this, some of you have forgotten that you're not out. The hippie movement, some of you need to know the hippie movement's past. We're not in in that anymore. Uh, You know, you'll... (laughs) The guys with the, the pigtail that go down to here and, that, and, the front, and the hairline that goes back to here, they need to know the hippie, hippie movement's mass. But, but there was a time in, uh, in, the, in the 60s where there was a great amount of the hippies that were coming to Jesus and wanting to come to the church, but the church didn't want them to come into the building because they, they didn't have shoes on. They wore, they're barefoot. Uh, they, 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 why did they dress like that? Why did they act like that? And they, and they re, repelled them because of the way they looked. And I want to make sure that we have a deep heart on the inside, that we have a place that is a magnet where people are drawn to the love of Jesus as in our lives and in our ministry. And that the next generation, I'm not going to try to look like them. I'm not going to buy skinny jeans with rips in them. I'm not going to walk around in flip-flops on Sunday morning. I'm, I'm, I am a 57-year-old man. That's just what I am. I can't, I, I can't change that, okay? So, so I'm just going to be... So, but I, I just want us to make sure that we accept people with the love of Jesus. And that we're going to do whatever we can to demonstrate that love of Jesus to the next generation. And that we're going to reach into the... Jesus wants the next generation. He died for them. And he wants us to go after them. Listen to this verse here in Matthew chapter 19, starting at verse 13 through 15. Very short portion of scripture. It says, the little children were were brought for Jesus to lay his hands upon them and to pray. But the disciples scolded those who brought them. Don't bother Jesus. Don't bother him, they said. 
But Jesus said, let the little children come to me and don't prevent them, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. And he put his hands upon their heads and he blessed them before they left. Now, oftentimes we understand when it speaks of little children here, it is most likely speaking of very young children. But I think we can understand from this portion of scripture, Jesus wanted the next generation to come to him. Jesus wanted to bring that next generation to him so that he might bless them. It almost gives us a mandate here that he said that, 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 that it needs to be like the kingdom of God. It needs to be like these little children of them coming in generation after generation. People coming to know the, the good news of Jesus Christ. And he scolded those disciples who tried to push the little children away to say that Jesus didn't have time for those kind. That Jesus didn't have time for those that, that weren't his closest followers. We want to make sure that we're the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and that we bring the next generation together, not just to entertain them, not even to get them to like us, but to get them close to Jesus that's in us. That's our goal. Why? Because the Jesus that's in us is the Jesus that can transform and change their life. Where Jesus wanted to be so close to them that he was able to put his hand on them and to bless them to touch their life in a, in a safe way, to touch their life in, in a powerful way that was they were going to leave different than they came because they had an encounter with Jesus in their lives. I want to make sure that we know deep on the inside of us that we want to encounter the next generation. And when they come into our closeness, that they are transformed and changed because of the love of Jesus that's in us that they're empowered, that they're blessed, that they're brought closer to God because of the Jesus that they've seen in our lives. I was just thinking of, you know, how much people are trying to uh, protect the next generation. We would have thought it never as a child, but, but now you can get bulletproof or bullet-resistant backpacks now for your kids for school. From between $100 to $500, depending on how much you like your kid, you can get a backpack that is bulletproof or bullet resistant uh, that, that, that they can have. It, of course, it doesn't cover their whole body, but they, it's something that they could somewhat hide behind. I mean, it's sad in, one, in, in a great way in this day and age that that's what we have to do. But I got to thinking about that, how much people would pay, even maybe even sacrifice for, to give their child this much hope in a crisis situation that they might be able to get behind and not giving them Jesus the hope for eternal life that they need in their lives. That we, we get more consumed about protecting the flesh than we do preparing our children for eternity. And, I, and, all, and again, I say, in this day and age, it's sad that we have those situations. It's sad that these things are going on. But it, if nothing else, it should ramp us up to understand what we need to be after to, in reaching this next generation, touching their lives, helping them, being the Jesus that they need to get close to so that they're really ready for a transformation in their lives. I, I'm not opposing. If you can afford and want to get your kid a bulletproof vest or, vest or, or backpack or whatever, I'm not opposed to those things. I'm just saying let's make sure the heart's ready. And let's not make sure that it's not just for our kid. Because that bulletproof the whole thing, it's just big enough for your kid to get behind. If we're not careful in our religiosity, we get our kids prepared for heaven. And we let the less, rest of the neighborhood go to hell around us. We need to understand that, that we've got some, a bigger Jesus than just for our kids. We've got a Jesus that's big enough for a whole generation. And this next generation, they need Jesus in their lives. They need to be transformed and changed. They need more than body armor to protect them. They need something that's going to protect their heart and their soul in their life. And that is the transformational power of Jesus Christ in their lives. So how are we going to do that? How can we do that? In many ways, we've been restricted by our government. In some ways, we've been restricted by our culture. But there's one thing that they cannot stop us from doing, and that's praying. 
There's one thing that the enemy cannot stop us from doing, and yet we so easily give up on. And so today I want to talk just a little bit for us, stir us up on the inside, that not only does Jesus want this next generation, it should show up in our prayers just how much Jesus wants this next generation. I want to encourage us for a little bit this morning that we start to pray for the next generation, not just some fluffy prayer, not just some nursery rhyme prayer, not just some little quote that we can get, but we get on our knees and we start to seek heaven. God, what do you want us to pray? How do you want us to pray? And we don't pray until we see change. We don't quit until we see the power of God starting to transform and change neighborhoods, school systems, and communities. That we start to look even at the next generation and we don't care how far their pants are sagging or where the, what, how their hair is done or what tattoos they're wearing or deep cry on the inside. Do they know Jesus in their lives? Does it burn deep on the inside of us? That we see this next generation that has basically been raised up in a non-religious environment, left to themselves, easily tormented by the devil, deceived by society. Does it stir us up that we must do something about this? And one of the greatest things that we can do is we can pray. But will we pray? Not fluffy prayers. Not just God help and prayers, but where we get into the presence of God so much that we know what God wants to do in this next generation. And God even prepares us and speaks to us the things that we need to deal with in prayer. Turn with me, if you would, a very familiar portion of Scripture we've been looking at over and over for the last year or so in Matthew chapter 6. A portion of scripture that's so familiar that we can quote it without thinking about it. And that's a dangerous thing sometimes when you can quote the word without thinking about what you're saying. Where we become just a parrot and we just rolls off of our lips but doesn't stir our heart. For just a few moments in the context of what we're talking about, praying for this next generation. Think about what we're saying here. Jesus' disciples have come up to him and they said, teach us to pray. There's something about the way Jesus prays that is totally radically different than the way they'd seen anyone else pray. We see there's a connection between heaven and what Jesus is saying, and we want to see those same results. This is not just a prayer for us just to recite. This is not a prayer just to go over, just to get God's attention. This is how God wants to transform this world and the next generation when we truly believe this word and we truly take it to heart and we really pray it. Here in Matthew chapter 6, verse 8, it says, <clears throat> do not, uh, but a uh, bean, <clears throat> excuse me, I got a, something in my throat here. There we go. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knows what things you have need of even before you ask him. After this manner, therefore, pray you, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Here it is. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We have the right to pray for God's will to be done in the next generation as if they were in heaven. Now, we can't make them do it. But we want to give them every opportunity as possible to know the way that God wants them to experience life, to experience his love, to experience his purpose for them. He goes on, give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We look at that scripture and we go over it real quickly and we'll come back to that praying that his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But I want us to pause for just a moment and look at verse 13. It says, and lead us, 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 not just me, but lead us. There is, there's a prayer here that he is saying that we can pray for others. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Lead us not into temptation. Evidently, you know, the Bible says that God tempts no man with evil. So temptations are not of God. 
Now, this world offers temptations to us. The enemy plans temptations before us. As we look at the next generation, there's probably some temptations that they're going to encounter that maybe we didn't, but God can still deliver them from. And so he says, lead us not into temptation. Reveal those things that we're vulnerable to. A temptation oftentimes in our life life is a weakness. A temptation is something that personally I have a desire for and then it can be perverted along the way. This last week it was so nice of an individual, a couple of the, uh, uh, young ladies came to the office and they brought me a, a lemon pie this week. Everyone say bless their heart. <laughs> it was so wonderful. They brought me a lemon pie and, and it was my favorite. I sat down there and I had a big wedge for, break, for lunch and I had a a big piece for breakfast, and I just kept eating the whole thing until somehow it just disappeared. It just disappeared. You bring Marilyn a lemon, or excuse me, a coconut cream pie, and I have no temptation whatsoever. Why? Because I'm not real a fan of, of coconut. Uh, a coconut is, I've tried coconut milk, I've tried coconut water, I've tried coconut in soup, I've tried coconut in pie, I've tried coconut in candy bars, and, and, and just, if they'd leave out the coconut, it'd be all right, you know, but I'm just not a coconut. What am I saying? I'm not tempted to eat a whole coconut pie, because I don't like it, but I'm vulnerable to eat a whole lemon pie. And then a lemon bundt cake that came. And then there were some other things. And so those, those are more because that's my personal desire. This next generation has some things that you would say, why would they, well, I would never do that. Why would they do that? That generation is vulnerable. The enemy is setting them up. The culture is setting them up. We need to pray for them that they would see what that vulnerable nature is, that we see that the tactic that the enemy is putting before them, see what the enemy is trying to do to pull my, then deliver us from the evil one. You know there is an evil one. Church, this is where we've got to wake up. This isn't just about trying to get uh, more, more of the next generation to come to church because they, they like the way we do it. It is trying to help them to see this is a spiritual thing that's going on here. This is the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light. This is the evil one who is trying to steal, kill, and destroy the next generation and those that are of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ that need to be proclaiming life and, and freedom that is in Christ Jesus and the truth that is in the Lord Jesus Christ. That it is a spiritual battle that needs to go on that we need to rise to our place and say, I must go to prayer and deal with this thing in the realm that needs to be dealt with, that Satan is exposed that the kingdom of darkness and its tactics are exposed, and the evil one is also the defeated one, and that we take our place, that there is a place in the spiritual realm that we can, we can, we can pray with authority, that we can pray with, 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 with power, that we can pray the will of God to be accomplished and the will of God to be done here in this day and in this hour. We must be people of prayer. And yes, it has come to that. We pray. We pray like we believe that God is able to defeat the enemy. We pray like we believe that every situation that has been something that the enemy has put in a place to, to take down this next, uh, next generation, that that opportunity to sin is exposed and that they see, they see the, the enemy. They see what he was trying to do and it would be revealed to them. We need to pray and release the supernatural power of God in the next generation. They need to have a sense of the supernatural leading of the Holy Spirit away from sin in their life and the plan of the enemy to kill, steal, and destroy in their life. They need to sense the presence of God. And if necessary, yes, I believe in the ministry of angels. If God sent an angel to warn Joseph to take Jesus into Egypt so that he would be safe, why would God not send angels to warn and to help us in this day and age with us, the body of Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ working through us in this day and age and in our children in this day. I believe in the angelic work of the Holy Spirit, or I mean the angelic work of this day of God's angels at work. What else are they going to be doing? 
What else are they going to be? Let's release them through our prayers. Let's believe. I think sometimes the church has more faith in demonic spirits than we do have on the help of angels in our lives. Let's, let's believe God that we are our children, that there are angels over them, protecting them and watching over them and helping them. Let's release the supernatural in this next generation. I was just talking to someone recently, and it was an older person, and they said, you know, I really struggle going to church. I don't, I just don't get the, the flashing lights, and, 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 and you open the door, and it's like, it's like fog is coming out the doors, and, and I, I, just, I just don't get it. And, and, we, and maybe an older generation, they don't. Folks, don't get caught up on the flashing lights, whether they're there or they're not there, unless they're behind you, and then you need to be aware of them. Don't get caught up on, on the, the smoke and, 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 and the fog and, unless the fire alarm goes off. When we need to, though, we can't replace anything without, for the presence of God. We, we can't replace something that attracts naturally if we don't have the supernaturally there. And just because you don't have flashing lights and you don't have fog doesn't mean the presence of God is there either. We've got to be a people that are praying and where there's people that are calling on heaven, heaven seems to answer in that situation. And if we're going to be a people that we believe in this next generation is going to move, that we believe our youth workers and children's workers, that we believe that, that God wants to do something in this neighborhood where he has planted us geographically, if we believe that something's going to happen, we're going to have to pray because hell doesn't want it to happen. So we need to release heaven's will on earth. Releasing it. Praying for our children and our, and our young people that there's an abundance of grace that comes into play in their lives. That even when they are about to do something, that God's grace encounters them. Do you remember back in, 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 back in Numbers 22 when Balaam was trying to go and curse the children of, of, of Israel, children of God there, and, and the angel came and stopped the, the, the donkey that he was riding on from going forward. God was so intent and trying to keep him from doing the wrong thing that he sent an angel there to even stop the donkey. How about in this day and age, God sends some angels to stop some cars from going where they're going, stop, stop some people from walking down some streets that they're, they're going down, some of these young people that they, they're going to regret doing it later. It's not the plan of God. It's not the will of God. How about sending, if we've got demonic forces that are drawing people, how about some of the angelic forces of God? Because there are more that are with us than are against us last time I checked and that are released to do some supernatural things. And then as youth to wake up the next morning and find out what happened at that party they didn't go to or found out what happened in that situation that they didn't make it to and found out that there was the grace of God in abundance that worked into their lives. It's time for us to see the supernatural in the next generation. We're asking them to believe stuff that, that, that they're not seeing. And to some degree, it, it is part of our, our, our walk of faith. But I also believe that they need to see the power of God to transform and change their lives. I believe that we need to be reaching into that spiritual realm so that we can have more than body armor because body armor doesn't protect people from spiritual attacks. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. We're talking about uh, reaching into this next generation spiritually. Praying for them. Praying for them intensely. Praying for them on purpose praying for them biblically, praying for them that for the power of God to be seen. Paul writing to the church here in Ephesians chapter 6, he's writing to believers. And in one sense, he's praying, uh, revealing to us the, the spiritual warfare that, that's going on, not just for adults, not just for the church, but, but generationally here, the things that are happening. And he's writing to the whole church and he's calling on them to pray. He's calling them to, to release the power of God and be very serious in their life about re releasing the power of God and taking their place to rule and reign in the spiritual realm. That we just don't leave it up to God, whatever your will is. But he said, take my hand and pray my will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. Paul writing to the church here in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10, he says, finally my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. There is a devil. There is an evil one. 
He has plans to attack. There are things that he is going to do. You're not going to defeat the enemy with body armor. You're not going to stop the enemy just because you try to do good. You have to have a spiritual force working in your life. And it is the power of God. He says that, 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 that take the whole armor. It will stop all the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle with, against flesh and blood. Do you realize that? We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But we do wrestle. When's the last time you wrestled in the spiritual realm? When's the last time you locked horns with the enemy and said, someone's going to give up here and it's not going to be me? When's the last time you stood up against a horde of demons and said, this ain't right, this school belongs to Jesus? My kids go there. Light will be overcoming darkness in this school. My children go there. They will have angelic beings around them when they walk those, those halls, when they sit in those seats. There is the power of God present with them everywhere that they go. When's the last time that, you know, remember Greg Waffen? Greg used to drive around to the different schools here in town and park in their parking lots and pray for that school. Who's taken Greg's place since he passed away? You see, he was serious about prayer. He didn't just go to the school that his daughter went to and prayed. He went to every school. Couldn't stay too long because he didn't want to get turned in. But, uh, you know, he he went to every school. What would happen, you know, schools starting up here, you got school zones. There'll be people that will remind you about that. But the school zones are here. What would happen if every time you went through a school zone sign, you just slowed down and started praying while you were there? You know what they say, school zone, be alert. Folks, I think we need to be more spiritually alert than just naturally alert. We need to slow down and realize this isn't just a school zone, this is a war zone. The enemy's after our next generation. Are we taking it serious? Are we just blaming the school system? Are we just blaming the teachers? Are we just blaming the culture? You can gripe and complain all you want to. Let's do something. Let's, let's go to a higher realm and take authority. Let's start to pray for the teachers. Let's start to pray for those in authority. Or start to believe in, in God working in their life. Huh? Let's, let's take this thing. Let's wrestle with those demonic forces that are trying to take our genera- the next generation. He says that we should... We wrestle not with flesh and blood. What do we do then? He says, but we do wrestle uh, against principalities, powers, against rulers of darkness of this age, rulers of darkness of this age, rulers of darkness of this age. We do wrestle against them. We do wrestle against them. Some of us need to stop fighting with our kids and start fighting for our kids. Well, I don't have kids, Pastor but you still have a responsibility for the next generation. Huh? We still got to pray for the next generation. So we go on here. It says, against the spiritual uh, uh, hosts of wickedness in heavenly places, therefore take unto the whole arm of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day, having done all to stand. Stand therefore, gird yourself, with the truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness and having on the sheet, shod that with your feet with preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all this, take the shield of faith, which is able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. That works better even than the backpack, the shield of faith. Take the shield of faith. Take the, it quenches all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now here we are, verse 18. He's listed this whole big armor thing, talked about us engaging in warfare or wrestling with the kingdom of darkness. Verse 18, praying always. How often? How often? Sometimes? Just when your kids get a bad teacher? Just when you get, you know, get in trouble? Always. Praying always. Praying always. With all prayer and supplication in the spirit. Being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. That means the next generation, doesn't it? 
We need to be praying for them. In this next generation, there's prophets in that next generation. There's pastors in that next generation. There's worship leaders in that next generation. There's missionaries in that next generation. There's good dads and moms in that next generation. There are evangelists in that next generation. We need to be praying for them because if the enemy can stop them, if the enemy can control that next generation, he can damage what God wants to do in that next generation for what is to come yet. We need to be praying for them. We need to be praying in the Spirit. Holy Spirit, give me the wisdom that I need to be praying. I would encourage you to take some time and get alone with God and say, God, what is it that I could pray for this next generation? Get a word from Him. Get a, get a, a picture from Him. Get a vision from Him. What does heaven want to accomplish here on this earth. And for us then start to pray with intensity. If you want to write down a word today, write down intensity. Are we praying like we're wrestling? You know, when I was in high school, I was, uh, we lived in the country and I didn't do many sports at all. I was, my, basically my sport was trying to outwear my brother that was trying to beat me up. And that was, that was basically, uh, that sport was just called live. And, um, and so when we got into uh, physical education classes and stuff and did things, I was, you know, was, was not very good in any of the sports. And uh, back then we had the wonderful seasons where you would do the different sports. And I remember doing wrestling. I hated wrestling. I hated wrestling. Part of the reason I hated wrestling is because you match up by weight. And my weight was the, the same weight as the wrestling coach's son. And so I had to wrestle him. And, and that was always fun, to wrestle him. As much as I would try, by the time that that class was over, almost every time I just felt like I was just going to just vomit because I'd, I was just exercising so much effort <laughs> and oftentimes seeing little results. But uh, how much effort do you put into your prayer time? I'm not asking for anybody to vomit or anything. I'm, not, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, do we play at our prayer? Or do we understand how, just how serious this is? Do we, do we see the intensity that needs to be in our prayer life? Jesus says, suffer the little children to come unto me. It's almost a, a proclamation that's been given to us. Get out there and get that next generation and bring them to me. Reach into that next generation and bring them to an experience with Jesus. It's more than just bringing them to church. It's, it's more than just trying to get them to, to straighten up in life. It's what changes your life. It's when you have an experience with Jesus in your life. Having that intensity that we're praying for this next generation, that we're not just trying to get more youth in our church so our church doesn't get old and shrivel up someday. It's for getting the next generation in the kingdom of God so they can do what they're called to do. So real quickly, I'm sure the questions may be popping in some of you. Why should I pray? Maybe my kids are grown. Maybe I don't have kids. Maybe I'm in it. I don't know. Maybe the question is just popping in. But I just jotted down a couple of quick thoughts on, on why we should pray. Number one, Jesus instructed us to. How many of you think that's a good reason? Jesus instructed. Remember back in John, or excuse me, Matthew 6, we read, Jesus said, pray this way. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. How many of you, how many of you realize that in heaven, it's not the Father's will in heaven for, for the next generation to be controlled by sin? That there's not children or youth in heaven that are deceived by suicide? that are sold into self tra uh, sex trafficking, that are not engaged in abortion because they're told that's the easiest way to solve the problem in their life. They're not in the bondage of drugs. They're not deceived to think that they're worthless. They're not hurting themselves to try to get some kind of emotional feeling in their lives. It's not God's will in heaven, and it's not God's will here on this earth. And so he said, first of all, Pray about it. One of the first things you need to do about it is to pray about it. We need to engage spiritual force in this way because many of these things have a spiritual nature behind them. Sex trafficking is not just some perverted old men. It's demonic. 
Killing a baby on the inside of a womb is not just something that's making life more comfortable. It's demonic. To push something of this nature, to be able to see people, a, a life that is, is fresh and alive, and then within a matter of months, turn into to, to something that is barely existing because of the effects of heroin or, 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 or meth in their lives. It's not God. It's demonic. And we have to do more than just have some kind of social programs and some more education. We need to take and we need to wrestle with those demonic forces and say, in Jesus' name, you no longer have rule here. We're going to make it hard on you to take this next generation. We're going to take a stand and we're going to put up our head and we're going to say we're going to beat on the gates of hell and you will not prevail against the church and we will see transformation and change. We will see young people that will experience the power of God. They will be delivered. They will be set free. They will have purpose on the inside of them. They will be full of the presence of God in their lives and it's because of a church that cares enough to want heaven's will here on this earth. It's not God's will in heaven, then it's not God's will here on this earth. So Jesus instructs us to pray. Why do we need to do this? Why do we need to pray for the next generation? Because God's love in us wants to help. If you've got the love of God on the inside of you, there should be a desire on the inside of you to help, to do something. Do something. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world, he wanted to do something. So he sent his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but by him they might be saved. The love of God, the compassion of God that burns on the inside of us, according to Romans 5.5, 5, where the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. The love of God beats on us and says, I've got to do something to help that next generation. I've got to help them not make the mistakes that I have made. I've got to help them that they can achieve what God has created them to achieve and to be. I've got to help them so that they're not encapsulated and defeated by the enemy and easily distracted and, and pulled aside. The love of God on the inside of us wants to do something for people. Matthew 9, 36 says, when, they, when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus looks out over a mass of people and he has compassion on them. He has compassion on them because they're confused. I know we're running out of time this morning, but folks, I want you to know as I look out over this, this next generation, it's not a bunch of bad kids. They're confused. What they have been taught has confused them. Last night I was watching a couple of programs on North Korea, and the gentleman that went in and did, did the, 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 the videoing stuff, he said, by the time I got ready to leave, I started to see it different. It wasn't so bad as I thought. People seemed to be happier than I thought. He'd been in, encapsulated with the propaganda and was shown just exactly what they wanted him to see. He didn't go to the concentration camps of 50,000 people where you get in trouble because you try to catch a mouse to eat. Where little children will follow a cow and wait for the dung to fall to sort through it to see if there's still any grains of, of corn to be able to eat it. It's not shown the, those kind of things. And because of the lack of information that was given to him and then the slight of information that was given to him, his thinking started to change. Folks, it's so important in this day and age that we understand that this next generation, they're not bad. They're just going off of what they've been told. And oftentimes, propaganda has been populated by the deception of the enemy. And we need to simply love them and speak the truth in love to them. And the power of God to be seen in our lives 
and the love of God to be seen in our lives and the way that we, we treat them and reach out to them. We need to understand that God's love is in us and we've got to be really, we are ready to help and do anything that we can. Because oftentimes this next generation, they've been, they're confused. Again, I, I hate using my own illustrations, but, but just, the, 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 just how fresh they are on my head, uh, they bring it up. One of the questions they kept asking me down there is, no matter how many nurse, the doctor, whatever, they would say, now when you fell and hit your head, uh, were you confused? Did you lose consciousness? Were you, were you dizzy? They kept coming back because if I had had a point where I was confused, it would reveal that there was a more serious matter there. And in this generation, folks, that's coming up, they've had, been hit hard. They've been hit hard with our generation. The way oftentimes it's been treated. The way things that we have said, things that we have done. And there's a little bit of confusion there. We just need to get that confusion straightened out with the truth of God's word and the way that we're going to live a living testimony in front of them, the way we treat them. I treat people different. I'll just be honest. I treat people different than I'm praying about. That I care enough to spend time in private praying for them. I treat them different when I engage them. So we need to reach out to those people and care about them. Do what we can. Why do I need to pray for, the, for that next generation? Jesus said so. The love of God on the inside of me compels me. And in closing, number three, it's because Satan is a thief. They do not belong to him. Jesus has purchased them with his redemptive blood. The ransom has already been paid. The scripture tells us in 1 Timothy 2 that it's God's will for all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. They do not belong to the enemy. He's trying to steal them. And we need to make sure that they understand that the love of God is available and everyone who calls in the name of the Lord, they can be saved and know his, his, his transformational power in their lives. We need to be doing our part. What is our part? Prayer. It has to start there before anything else. It all starts on prayer and it is continued on prayer. You get alone with God. You spend time in prayer. You get a word. You get some scriptures that go with that word and confirm it. And then you pray until we see things change. We pray until we see things change. We pray until we see things change. We pray until we see things change. We, we, things change. we all know the old st statement. It's a summary of a, a longer letter that was sent. All that basically takes for evil to, to conquer is for good men to do nothing. All that takes for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. It's easy not to pray. But we need to get in there and we need to wrestle with it. We need to get in there and fight for this next generation. We need to get in there and pray for them. Like, we, we're, like we're standing in, in faith for them. We need to pray for the supernatural power of God to be in manifestation. We need to pray with the love of God in our hearts motivating us to do this. Jesus wants the next generation. And we want them to. To come to that kingdom of God. How should we finish today? We could ask for a show of hands for everyone who will pray more intensely. And I'm sure that all of us would raise our hand. I could ask for those that have children. Stand. And that, and that would be good. But I think as a church it would be good for us those that are in children's ministry or youth ministry, any student ministry, if you would just stand, because you're kind of on that front line of ministry-wise. And so if you're in children's ministry or in youth ministry, in any dimension, would you please just quickly stand up? And we want to just, we want to pray. We want to pray with you. We want to pray for you. We at Grandview, we believe in reaching that next generation. We do what we can. We, we are, we're trying to reach out even more than we have. We, we're, but, but folks, without the power of God, we can do little. Almost nothing. So let's pray. And if you're close to one of these people, you can put your hand on them if you want to. Let's just pray for them that they sense the anointing, the power of God for them to do even more where it comes to me. I just want to make sure that when youth children come to this church, when students come to this church, they encounter the power of God. 
and that our youth ministers, our children's ministers, that they are empowered by the Holy Spirit. They're not doing it out of their giftings. They're not doing it out of their abilities. They're not doing it just because uh, it's something that they like to do. They sense the presence of God doing what they're called to do. So reach your hand out towards at least one of these individuals. They're, they're helping us to reach the next generation. Father God, we just pray one for another right now. And we thank you. Your will on earth is going to be accomplished. That these individuals that you have placed in, in strategic positions of ministry, Lord, that they're going to sense the power of the Holy Spirit even working more through their lives. That we are reaching into this next generation that is confused and hurt, dear God, and need wholeness, they need brought to Christ, they need uh, restoring in their lives emotionally, physically, mentally, dear God, most of all spiritually, that you are going to use us, dear God, to reach this next generation, that we are going to, to, to do all that we can to bring the love of God into their lives in a supernatural way. We thank you, Father God, for your divine protection. We understand that as we go forward to do your will, that the adversary will try to stop us. But we will overcome, we will be victorious, and it will be a testimony of the intensity of God's love reaching into this next generation. We receive the power of the Holy Spirit to do what Jesus did while he was on this earth as we go forward for your glory and to demonstrate what God wants to do. In Jesus' name, amen.